Today we are talking to Dr. Nicholas Guyot, uh, the author of Bind Us Apart, How Enlightened Americans Invented Racial Segregation. Welcome to Radera. Thank you very much, Manish. What is the book all about? Uh, well, it's an attempt to try to explain where racial segregation comes from in American life. Uh, and we have a story about that, uh, which usually says that segregation was something that happened after the American Civil War. And it's something that white Southerners did to try to take back control uh, after they'd been forced to give up slavery during the Civil War. Um, and what I tried to do in my book is show that actually Americans have been thinking about separating the races, particularly separating white people from African Americans or Native Americans, all the way since the founding of the United States. So this actually isn't a story about the white South following the Civil War. This is a story with deeper, longer roots, right back to the founding moments of American life. Mm -hmm. What was America like before the Civil War and, and what were the driving forces at the time uh, economically, uh, uh, internally between the different population and politically? Well, that's an interesting question because we sometimes imagine that the period before the Civil War, uh, if we think about black people and Indians, was characterized by two phenomena. Uh, one of them is removal, the removal of native people, and the other one is slavery. And so it's very easy for us to imagine that in that period before 1865, most white people were racist and most white people supported slavery uh, or supported the removal of Native peoples, Native Americans. And what I tried to do in the book is show you that actually in the first decades of the United States, so in the period from the Declaration of Independence, 1776, right through until I would say the 1820s or even into the 1830s, there was actually a very substantial number of Americans, white Americans, who didn't believe, or at least weren't convinced, that Native Americans or African Americans were inferior to white people. They didn't believe that slavery's triumph was inevitable, and they didn't believe that Native Americans should be eliminated, should be expelled, or that there was any reason to think that Indians and black people couldn't finally become citizens. So in a sense, what I tried to do in the book is recover that context, that very important context, before slavery became as immensely profitable as it did, which is a story of the 1820s and the 1830s in particular, uh, or before the logic of removing and expelling Indians really became nationally accepted, which again is something that doesn't really happen until the 1820s or the 1830s. So I'm very interested in that 50-year period or so from the Declaration of Independence right the way through around 1830, and that's what the bulk of the book is focused on. And you have two very good charts in the beginning of the book where you show by map where the Indians were and where they were moved or they were asked to resettle. But uh, the deeper, I think there are, there are a couple of themes that are very uh, deep and they resonate throughout the book. And I think maybe we can touch upon it. All men are created equal. That is the founding principle of the Constitution in the American. But uh, that was not what was happening at the time or for a long time. One of the ways in which I think the early United States is very interesting is that um, that phrase, all men are created equal, is right there in the Declaration of Independence. So it's there as a founding principle of 1776. Uh, and you might assume that the founding fathers simply thought they were saying all white men are created equal. And so in effect that their racism gave them a pass when it comes to thinking about black people or Native Americans. And what I tried to do in the book is show you that actually uh, the white founders of the United States were far less confident that you could exclude black people or Indians from those very simple words, all men are created equal. In fact, the founders came from a moment before what we consider to be 19th and 20th centuries kind of scientific racism. So before the idea that race is something that you could prove, that race is something that you could uh, ground in science. And in fact, most of these thinkers, most of the founding fathers from the late 18th century were instead involved in a much more enlightened enlightenment idea of race, which said, essentially, all human beings have the same potential. And the only reason why people's skin color is different, or the only reason why people's behavior is different, some people might seem more civilized than others, all of that is based on your environment. So, you know, the climate, but also on your human environment. So to put it in crude terms, uh, as one enlightenment theorist suggested, if you took a bunch of people from Senegal and you swapped them with a bunch of people from Denmark, then after 60 or 70 or 80 years, 
the Senegalese would become completely white and the Danes would become completely black. So this idea that human beings could change, that there was something plastic about being a human being, is really the idea that the founders inherited. So very soon after all men are created equal was put out there in a Declaration of Independence, African Americans began to say, well, if this is true, then that means slavery can't exist. So African Americans themselves began to challenge the idea that slavery could exist in a land that was dedicated to all men are created equal. And that same phrase also got applied to Native Americans. So in a sense, you had a big problem for the founding fathers, which is that their ideology, their big theory of humanity said equality. But in practice, they had black people, nearly a million black people by the turn of the 19th century in slavery. And of course, they also had hundreds of thousands of Native Americans that they saw as being uncivilized. So what could they do? And that's the challenge that I try to look at in the book. How did these white founders who styled themselves as enlightened and styled themselves as generous, how did they confront the problem of turning these people of color into potential citizens? Then how did they do it? In a sense, it's a tragic story, I think. Um, there, there are two phases. I mean, the first one is to assume that it might be possible to end slavery or to civilize, and I use that uh, word with scare quotes, but to civilize um, Native Americans alongside where they already lived. So the idea would be that you could free black people from slavery and that then you would try to give them education, you would try to give them training, you would try to up repair some of the damage that being enslaved had done to their characters. You could do all that with them in person close to where you lived. The same with Native Americans, that in effect what you would do is uh, you would have white people living alongside Native Americans, the kind of civilized nature of the whites would rub off on Native Americans, and those Native Americans would be lifted up. So in effect, for both African Americans and Native Americans, you could improve them in ways that might prepare them to become citizens. And that word citizens is actually used by many of these white reformers uh, that I write about in the book. So that's the end game here, is that apparently blacks and Indians could become citizens. That's the first phase, but that goes wrong for all sorts of very interesting reasons. Um, and I could get into them, but for now, I'll just say that, that, that it goes wrong. And then the next phase, and this is what the, the last part of the book is about, uh, has the same benevolent, enlightened, you know, generous sounding white uh, theorists and reformers and politicians saying that actually the easiest way for us to improve or to civilize black people or Native Americans is for them to go somewhere else. So this idea of racial separation actually enters American life, not with a, a language of racism, you know, the idea that these people are permanently inferior to white people, but rather with this language of improvement, that the way to try to get black people to recover from the effects of slavery or to try to civilize Native American people is to send them somewhere else. So there's something very ironic and I think tragic about the fact that for these early racial theorists and racial reformers who are white, they genuinely believe in separate but equal, or at least they say they do. So that phrase, which we think of as being to do at the end of the 19th century, to be conservative and Southern and all about Jim Crow and the kind of racialized segregation of the South after the Civil War, actually separate but equal is a phrase that would resonate with these liberal enlightened reformers from the early part of the 19th century, which is kind of an unnerving conclusion. Mm -hmm. So it transformed from all men are equal to separate but equal. Yeah, and, and in a sense, I think, especially thinking about the contemporary world, uh, I am unnerved um, at the ease with which people uh, who style themselves, white people who style themselves as genuinely interested in equality, could become accustomed to or even start promoting racial separation. Because if you think about it, Manish, I mean, we live in the contemporary moment in a world where there's enormous segregation. I mean, I'm thinking about America's schools, extraordinary levels of segregation within the public school system. I'm thinking about the major cities, cities like Los Angeles or Chicago or Milwaukee or Detroit or even New York, where again, there are astonishing levels of neighborhood residential segregation. Well, the heroes of my book are really the anti-heroes of the book. I mean, you know, these white people who claim that they were interested in racial equality finally made peace with the idea of separation. And although as a historian, you never want to draw too close a connection between the past and the present. I do see something very contemporary in these white reformers who style themselves as racially progressive, 
but in fact come to terms with and make peace with really serious schemes for segregation and separation. And you have a very nice quote in the beginning of the book where it says, uh, getting rid of a problem is what we like to do rather than solving a problem. Uh, yeah, that's right. Actually, the uh, the quotation is from the great uh, black intellectual uh, and theorist uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and the actual quote is, um, we often congratulate ourselves more on getting rid of a problem than on solving it. Uh, and again, I mean, I, I just feel we're in a very interesting place right now in terms of thinking about race, both as historians, but also in terms of thinking about race in the contemporary landscape of the United States, because, I mean, there are sort of two ways of thinking about race in America, I think. I mean, one of them is to think about it as being this kind of upward journey. So in other words, back at the beginning, there was slavery. Then there was all men are created equal. Then slavery was abolished uh, in the northern states. Then you have the Civil War and slavery was abolished in the southern states. Then a century later, you get civil rights. And then finally, you get Barack Obama. Right. So you can kind of plot all this on a graph and you start in the bottom left hand corner and you end up in the top right hand corner. And this is an upwards sweep. So American history is this kind of progressive, improving story. Actually, the other way of thinking about this is to say from the very beginning of the United States, Americans, white Americans, many of whom saw themselves as enlightened and benevolent and liberal, have had massive problems with living alongside people of color. They haven't been able to do it themselves. They've been happy to suggest that other white people might do it. But these wealthy elites that I write about very often don't want to live alongside people of color themselves. And that story about integration versus segregation, I think it's much harder to plot that story on this upwards curve, because that's the problem back then, which, as I said, looks unnervingly like some of the problems that we have today, if you think about race and space. So I would try and encourage us perhaps to think about that narrative of race in America, not so much in terms of the battle you know, for slavery or battle against slavery, or even in terms of the Indian battles for removal or opposing removal, but rather to think about integration. Because from the very, very beginning of American history, the question in the minds of white people has never just been, should we end slavery? Or should we you know, remove native peoples? The question has been, can we live alongside peoples of color in a republic dedicated to all men are created equal. And we're still trying to work out that problem today. Mm -hmm. Earlier, as you were explaining in two part to the question, uh, you said that things went wrong uh, and made, there were many reasons for it. And so you can expand on it later. Would you explain that a little bit more in detail? So what went wrong? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, one of the problems uh, and a, a very obvious problem is that um, for these enlightened white reformers, and again, I'm talking here about people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, people like the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, the Frenchman who helped so much in the American Revolution. I'm also talking about other leading politicians and churchmen, newspaper journalists and editors. So a whole sweep, if you like, of the intellectual, political and cultural elite of the early republic. One of the problems they had was they just had a really hard time appreciating other cultures on their own terms. So to give you a very crude example, when they said that Native Americans or African Americans could become equal to whites, initially at least, say in the 1780s or the 1790s, some of these liberal white theorists actually imagined that Native Americans or African Americans would become white. The president of Princeton University back then, a guy called Samuel Stanup Smith, was a very famous uh, race theorist, possibly the most famous theorist and author on race anywhere in the Atlantic world at the end of the 18th century. And he believed that if you brought Native Americans closer to civilized white people, or if you brought African Americans away from the fields of the South and into the kind of salons of the North, the features of their faces would change. They would actually become less black or less Indian, and they would start to look more white. Well, there's clearly a massive problem with that idea, not just because in science it doesn't work, but also because it suggests that although they're saying all men are created equal, what these white theorists really think is that all men have the potential to become white. So that's a huge, huge, huge problem here, that this idea of universal equality is really based on the idea that white ways or the white appearance or what everyone else needs to be. And that's a particularly big obstacle when it comes to thinking about Native Americans, because for very good reasons, Native Americans have their own culture and very often want to hold on to it. And it's very hard for the white reformers 
who are proposing ways of dealing with Indians to understand why Indians would want to carry on living their own way of life. So that's one big problem. Um, just very quickly to mention two others, another big problem which affects this first phase of the scheme, you know, where native peoples and African-Americans are supposed to be brought up as citizens next to white people. Another big problem is that these elite whites, these wealthy white reformers I write about, very often don't want to do the work of civilizing or lifting up people of color themselves. So again, to give you an example, uh, the Secretary of War in 1816, a guy called William Crawford, who's from Georgia, uh, he proposes that the federal government encourage marriage between white people and Native Americans. Well, it turns out that on the East Coast, when newspapers write about this scheme, the newspapers that support it say, this is fine, providing the white people who do the intermarrying live somewhere else on the frontier. So again, you see this kind of class element to this, where these wealthy, these well-off, these elite reformers are happy to promote integrating the races providing it's poorer white people who do the integration, you know, which again is potentially a problem. And just one final thing to mention in terms of other reasons why these civilizing and uplift schemes uh, don't work. There's real difficulty, I guess, when you think about the early United States in figuring out who is responsible for pushing forward these kinds of policies. I mean, remember that during the 1930s, when you got the New Deal and um, Franklin Roosevelt and, you know, the beginnings of things like employment insurance and Social Security and all those things, the kind of big government moment in American history, that's the 1930s. We're talking here about the first decades of the United States. There isn't really a big government, right? I mean, the federal government is a few dozen people. I mean, it's not a huge entity. You don't have a modern welfare state. You don't have all of those mechanisms that could actually begin to make restitution to black people who've been enslaved. You don't have the resources coming from the federal government to run a schools program, for example. So even if the will had been in place universally, and even if these reformers had been able to figure out a solution, you could make the case that actually the tools of government really back then weren't very strong, they weren't very efficient, and they certainly weren't up to a task like this, which is, if you think about it, an enormous task. I mean, undoing the injustice of slavery it's something that we're still working on, and it's certainly something that presented an enormous challenge to the governing mechanisms of that period. So those are just three of the ways in which that first phase of the scheme went, went wrong. And what's, again, so tragic, and I think also so unnerving, is how quickly many of these reformers believe that if you can't lift up peoples of color alongside white people, you can send them somewhere else, and then they can be lifted up on their own in isolation and in separation from whites. Questions are simple, the answers are not easy, and sometimes <laughs> unsettling. You have treated very well in the book, uh, in a great depth uh, that you go in, and how the Native Americans were treated and how the blacks were treated. The Native Americans were asked to assimilate and get together and settle into a, some kind of organized farming and give up the communal land property. And the blacks uh, were pretty much asked to leave the country and go back to Liberia as the colonists would, would like that to happen, which did not happen. Would you go on to explain uh, how, and let's take each community individually and how they were, how the whole experiment went further and resettling first the Native Americans and then we talk about the African Americans as well. I would say that um, one of the things I hope the book does, and I hope the readers will appreciate uh, in the book, or perhaps might help them see things a bit differently, is it does try to bring the stories of African Americans and Native Americans together. And I can tell you just for a second why I think that's so important. We very often conclude that those two groups shouldn't really be studied side by side, because if I can put it in crude terms, white people eventually took labor from black people and took land from the Indians. So in effect, if you look at the period after 1825 or 1830, it's slavery that becomes much more entrenched in the American South. So that means keeping black people alongside you. And it's land grabbing, taking away the land from native people that becomes the dominant mode for Indians. So in effect, you can see these two different paths. They diverge from one another after 1830. Now that's an easy point to make. And there's, that's, not, that's not untrue. I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. However, What's so important is that we look at this earlier period, which again is the one I study in my book, where actually you have many, many more people, even in states like Virginia, that believe that slavery will not survive forever and believe that the economic benefits of slavery are not so huge 
that you shouldn't be thinking as an enlightened white person of getting rid of slavery. At the same time, the idea that native peoples could be civilized, quote unquote civilized, alongside white people is predominant amongst the same liberal enlightened reformers uh, you know, during this period. So in effect, in this period before around 1830, those different paths of slavery and Indian removal, they haven't diverged yet. And in that moment, for the 50 years or so following the founding, actually the way in which those two communities interact with white people and especially white reformers is terribly similar. So it's incredibly important, I think, that we don't make the mistake of assuming that the outcomes, which do look different, I mean, you know, one population is mostly expelled, the other is mostly enslaved. We mustn't allow those different outcomes to obscure the fact that for 50 years, white people are thinking about these two groups in terribly similar ways. So I'm quite passionate about this because I think it's a very easy thing for us as historians not to look at these two communities side by side and to see them as white people saw them, which is as two related problems that might have the same solution. And of course, in the end, the solution that was proposed by my white reformers for the two different groups was the same. It was they should be removed and sent somewhere else. But this is the key thing about these two groups, that all along, Whenever white reformers proposed separation, or as they called it, colonization of people of color, the argument was that people of color themselves would agree to it because it was for their benefit. So, you know, you'd be able to persuade native people to sign a treaty saying they'd be happy to be moved across the Mississippi, or you'd be able to persuade free blacks living in northern cities or black people who were enslaved to sign a piece of paper saying they'd be willing to go to a colony in Liberia or they'd be willing to go and be colonized in the Caribbean because it was for their benefit. And this is the key point, Manish, that actually what happened was peoples of color almost entirely, almost unanimously refused to say yes. So they refused to agree to the logic of separation. And that created a kind of crisis for these white reformers. Uh, one of them, a uh, very interesting uh, guy, uh, who was the Cherokee agent, and the United States Cherokee agent uh, immediately after the War of 1812, he wrote back to Washington and said, what should we do if they refuse to be saved by us? <laughs> so, you know, this notion that native people refuse to be saved because they won't agree to leave and go to the West, it creates a massive problem. And uh, I mean, what ended up happening is pretty simple. In the case of slavery, southern slaveholders in the Deep South, they don't get involved in these separation schemes because they never become truly anti-slavery. Cotton becomes very profitable after 1820, 1825 these deep South slaveholders hold on to slaves. In the upper South, in places like Virginia, where you don't have things like cotton, the slaveholders there couldn't persuade their slaves to go to Liberia or couldn't persuade them to leave. Anyway, in fact, many slaves who were asked preferred to be in slavery in the United States than to go to Liberia and Africa, the colony that had been established for them, partly because they knew they were American, but also because they feared they'd die in a colony in Africa. They heard all these things about disease and other problems around the setting up of the colony. So this is really crucial that, in effect, these schemes to remove peoples of color are based on the assumption that peoples of color themselves will agree that they're benevolent. And the moment peoples of color say no, in a sense, the whole scheme begins to look, you know, what it was, which is you know, something that a pipe dream for white people. And, and in case of Native Americans, I mean, just to finish the thought with Native Americans, what finally happens is the thing that most people who've been to high school history classes will remember, which is Andrew Jackson forces Native Americans to remove. He forces the Cherokees and other Indians in the Southeast on the Trail of Tears. So in 1838 and 39, they're forced by the military to go west. And this has gone down as this great, you know, genocidal, eliminationist, exclusionist, you know, expulsion of Indians. And all those things might be true, but the creepy thing for me is that the plan that he forces on the Indians is a plan that was invented by liberal reformers. And the only reason it didn't happen before Jackson took over is because Native Americans always refused to do it. It was Jackson who forced them to go at the point of the gun. And that's where you can see that all these separation schemes are a kind of fantasy. And it was all this sold in the name of saving them, helping them, to make them... Well, I mean, the funny thing is, Jackson actually continued with the rhetoric, right? So, I mean, all through his presidency, he said, oh, Native Americans are just like our white settlers going to the West. This is going to benefit them. But if you can't get Native peoples to sign on the dotted line, what do you do? And that problem had stymied reformers before Jackson, who had hoped to remove Native peoples benevolently 
Jackson, of course, doesn't do that. When he can't get the signature, the troops get sent out. So Jackson is the guy who you know, tears off this kind of liberal benevolent mask and shows these separation schemes for what they are, which in the end is, is racist. I mean, whether intentionally or functionally, their effect is to separate peoples and to remove you know, peoples of color that don't want to go. And I think it's Jackson who kind of shows you the lie there. But what for me is unnerving is that the idea, the blueprint, the kind of architecture of separation, he didn't come up with that. It was come up with by his predecessors, so people like John Quincy Adams and James Monroe, so previous presidents in the White House, and by a whole bunch of reformers, many of them from northern states, you know, religious officials, missionaries who style themselves as, as enlightened. Taking this time period in the global context, uh, there are two extreme opposite examples. So one what happened in Brazil and one what happened in Australia. Uh, Brazil at the time was also going through immigration, not at that time, but much, much later years, again of African immigration there. But they have managed to do a better job in integrating the, assimilating rather, and integrating uh, various uh, uh, racial uh, communities. And in Australia, obviously, their treatment of aborigines has been completely opposite as well. Uh, was there any, were there any inherent fears that were driving this uh, so-called elitists who were largely wealthy, but they may not be elite, but they had, they controlled the powers and levers of power. Uh, what were the fears of integrating? Why, or was it just the inherent innate belief that they had that they were superior than others, or or that they just couldn't bring them together, or they were not willing to make the investments of lifting these communities they were far behind? Uh, what was their, what were their key concerns of never even trying to solve the problem uh, rather than just uh, get rid of it? Yeah, I mean, the two examples you brought up are extremely interesting and important ones. Um, and I'm not an expert in either country that you mentioned, Australia or Brazil, but I know enough to be able to make the comparison. I mean, I think in Australia, there were many, many, many hang ups amongst white settlers about mixing with Aborigines. Although, interestingly, British reformers, particularly British missionaries, originally conceived of amalgamating the races, so bringing together white settlers and Aborigines in both uh, Australia and New Zealand in the 1830s and the 1840s. So actually that idea was promoted in those places, albeit more by missionaries than by the politicians who are actually in charge of Australia and New Zealand. I think Brazil is a really interesting example because Brazil, like most of Latin America, saw much more racial mixing during the early decades and centuries of settlement. Um, I mean, as you know, as many listeners will know, in Latin America, so in Portuguese and Spanish America, the colonies got started earlier very often than they did in North America. So, you know, by comparison with 1607 in Virginia, you have people, you know, moving into Mexico in the 1510s and moving into Peru a little later. Uh, Brazil also an early 16th century story. And almost from the earliest days of settlement, the idea that white people, so people from Europe and indigenous people would intermarry became uh, very prominent partly because many European countries had trouble finding large numbers of settlers from Europe to go across to the New World and, and populate uh, those regions. So uh, it was something that was picked up even at the time, even in the late 18th century, you had historians uh, who would note the fact that British North America, the land that became the United States, had far less mixing of native people and white people than Latin America, or even than colonies in Africa or Asia. So there was always something about the mode of settlement, if you like, in British North America, which meant that there wasn't as much amalgamation and intermarriage between native people uh, and between white people. I think that what that did was, I mean, when you think about Brazil or you think about Mexico, those are clearly societies that had their own problems of race and racism and often had very elaborate hierarchies of racial belonging. So, you know, different shades of skin color that would determine where you were in the pecking order. But what they didn't have was quite the same incredibly stark distinction between black and white. So that's one thing I think that makes them rather different. I mean, of course, the other big context to try to explain your question is that there was already racial mixing going on in British North America around the time of the American Revolution, but it was in context which was seen as illicit or immoral. So I get into this quite a lot in the book. I mean, the whole middle section of the book tries to explain why white Americans had so many hang-ups about intermarrying with blacks and with Indians. 
And one of the conclusions that I've reached is that there was already a lot of racial amalgamation going on, but it was white slaveholders with black female slaves. And this was perceived almost certainly correctly by many white reformers in the North to be you know, deeply immoral. Many of these may be situations of rape. And it kind of demonized the whole idea of marriage or sex across the color line because, you know, the sex is going on, but it's happening in these contexts which are depraved. So you even have abolitionists, um, you know, people who are the most committed anti-slavery types in the 1830s saying that racial amalgamation is a really terrible thing because it's people in the South, the white slaveholders, who are responsible for this kind of depraved version of amalgamating the races. So, so I, I, in the end, I decided I had to write a big chunk of the book about this question because it is a fascinating one, why white people have so many hang-ups about intermarrying. But I'll, I'll just say this, you might be surprised to discover how many white people bring up the idea that it might be possible to end the race problem through amalgamation. And in the book, I try and show you why those ideas ended up going nowhere. Well, why didn't go anywhere? Well, there are a whole bunch of different reasons, but one of them, as I say, is because particularly slaveholders, I mean, take someone like Thomas Jefferson. In 1898, one of Thomas Jefferson's best friends wrote to him and said, why don't we just marry our slaves? Why don't we end slavery that way and end the race problem that way? And Jefferson never wrote back to his friend. And what's interesting is that he got that letter in 1798 at almost exactly the same time as uh, Sally Hemings, uh, the black woman with whom he'd been having an affair for the past 10 years, gave birth to his first mixed-race son. So Jefferson, in his own mind, found a way to live a family life in which he had children of color and yet publicly couldn't bring himself to admit that to the rest of the nation and to use that as a kind of moral example to say to the rest of the United States, we can do this. We can get past this through intermarriage. I mean, there are a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, Jefferson's a complicated guy, right? But I think the fact that he had people writing to him saying, why don't we marry our slaves? And he didn't write back to them is interesting. And of course, Jefferson's solution, racial separation, colonization from the 1770s right through until his death in 1826. He insisted, even though he had a mixed race family, that the solution here was to separate the races. So that moral problem, if you like, of accepting and admitting that you were having a relationship with people of color, that you could have children of color. In the end, it's one that defeated Thomas Jefferson. Moving on to the uh, second issue, which is Liberia, the colonization. Not many people take up on that. And, and how did that experiment or a scheme went ahead? Well, one of the problems, I guess, facing those people who came to recommend the separation of the races, uh, the white reformers who came to recommend this, was simply that there wasn't a place to which they could easily um, suggest sending uh, or colonizing African-Americans. And in the book, I show you the origins of this. Uh, I mean, it's a very interesting story. It's the British who originally created a colony in West Africa in 1787, the colony of Sierra Leone, which ironically was created to provide a home for refugees from the American Revolution, and specifically from slaves and other African-Americans who crossed the lines to fight for King George III against patriots like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. So those guys were evacuated from the American colonies at the end of the American Revolution. So when the United States had won its independence, some were sent to Canada, some came to London. They suffered from all kinds of problems in their new homes. And so it was proposed that they be given a colony in Sierra Leone. Um, folks in the US, these white reformers that I've mentioned, knew all about Sierra Leone and were looking to try to create something similar, perhaps even to send American uh, freed slaves to Sierra Leone right the way through until uh, 1816, which is when a great society was founded, this incredibly influential and powerful society called the American Colonization Society, which had the support of pretty much every major politician, North and South, in that moment. It met in Washington, D.C. Uh, James Madison gave his blessing to the society. The new president, James Monroe, who took over in 1817, he supported the society. And its plan was to create a colony in Africa that would initially resettle freed blacks, so African-Americans who'd already been freed, but who were supposedly struggling in the cities of the North, struggling to integrate, uh, creating all kinds of social problems, supposedly, because they weren't ready to fit in with white society. But the colony also proposed that it would eventually relocate black people who had been enslaved as well. So it would be a colony for freed slaves and for free blacks. And in 1820 and 1821, James Monroe used the U.S. federal government to create the colony of Liberia. And suddenly then there was this place 
to which uh, black people could be colonized. But again, I come back to the point I made earlier, which is that the key, key component of the colonization scheme for black people and Indians was that African-Americans were supposed to be willing to consent. You couldn't force them to leave or it was expulsion. And there are plenty of worries about this. I mean, white reformers talk about how they'll be seen on the world stage if they try to force black people to go. You know, this can't be like the expulsion of the Moors from Spain in 1492 or the expulsion of the Huguenots from France or any of these other famous expulsions in history. Black people have to see that this is in their interest and they have to agree to go. And to their huge credit, African-Americans from 1817 onwards, very, very few of them are willing to agree to the logic of colonization. They insist that they're American and they insist that they're staying put. And if there's a single reason why huge numbers of African-Americans were not sent to another part of the world, Africa or the Caribbean, during this period, it's because black people refused to go. So it's a great instance of where the agency, the decision-making and the conviction of African-Americans played a massive, massive role. I mean, despite slavery or, I mean, the agency of African-Americans here is really crucial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who is American at that time was not a very clear question or uh, there were not clear answers to that. And one nation only as you have a chapter in the book in part two. Uh, those are fascinating issues to explore at the time. Did the dynamic evolve in those uh, 50 years that you were uh, uh, focused in the book? Did the tone of the elitists ever soften or change or they were willing to go back to the heart of the problem or they all were always looking to continue on those policies because the white farmers, the southern white farmers, were very keen on, on expanding the cotton trade and they were looking for land and of course they needed labor and those were the two different ways to get that. Yep. And, and yep. They, they had economic incentive to continue on those, those two policies which were one of the main drivers of their behavior so to speak. That's very well put. I mean, I think in a way you only see this in retrospect, right? So you can Correct. kind of only imagine what the past looks like to the people who are living it by trying in your head to exclude the fact that you know the, the way the story ends. I mean, this is the big challenge or one of the big challenges of history. You know, how, how do you get into the minds of people in the past when you have the privilege, but in some ways the disadvantage of knowing how the story ends? I mean, it's a privilege because, you know, it, it's good to know where things end up. But it's also a disadvantage because you can't unknow, stop yourself from knowing the end. And by knowing the end, of course, it affects how you see the stuff that happens before the end. You know, you've got the spoilers right in your mind about how the story is going to end. So I think that's really crucial for understanding this whole period, because you're right. I mean, slavery and Indian removal, they're right there. You know, they're in the distance. They're the end game of this. But if you think about the period I'm interested in, so from the American Revolution, from the Declaration of Independence, 1776, right the way through until, say, around 1830, you have this period of 50 years or so, a little more than 50 years. And the way I see it is on various fronts, there is a window which is open on a better outcome, a window that's open on this promise of 1776. But the window is closing in all of these different avenues. So, for example, economically, it's quite clear in 1776 to many Americans, even in the South, in places like Virginia, that the economics of slavery are faltering, that it's harder and harder to make use of the slaves that you already have efficiently, and that the future might be in free labor. This is before the cotton boom. I mean, the cotton boom doesn't really kick in until after 1815, and it doesn't really take off until the 1820s and 1830s. So that economic window, if you like, that's open there, the idea that slavery might be abolished without doing terrible damage to the American economy. That economic window is open in 1776, but in the coming years and decades, you can see it beginning to close. I mentioned earlier this idea that some white reformers had that African Americans and Native Americans might actually become white. So if you think about race as being another window that's more open in 1776, as ideas about race begin to change, and as that idea that black people or Indians might turn white begins to fade, you can see that window beginning to close as well. And then finally, a third window, just thinking about the ways in which reformers begin to lose heart in schemes that don't seem to have worked. I mean, if you try anything, however hard you try, after a while, if it's not working out, you may conclude you get exhausted or you get depressed or you get disillusioned. I think that window also you see beginning to close 
on this idea of integration across those decades, because these initial schemes for educating black people or trying to civilize or train Native Americans in agriculture, all of those things begin to, 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 to wither or they don't work. And so you see that disillusionment begin to build as well. So if you like those three windows, the economic window, um, this sort of uh, uh, racial window, this idea of you know the way in which race is supposed to work, that begins to change. And then finally, this sense of disillusionment, all of these windows are starting to close. But of course, at the time, you wouldn't necessarily have known that they were starting to close. You know, it's only in retrospect that we can see that this moment of possibility around the founding really begins to get reduced and reduced and reduced. And in the end, we end up with segregation or slavery, in effect. So two horrific alternatives. Mm, just as the Britain, Great Britain faced the uh, imperial stretch and eventually the imperialism died away simply because it was just too expensive to be imperial. And the same thing would happen with the slavery. The cost of slavery just became unbearable. Yeah, it's true. But I mean, one massive difference between the British slavery context and the American one is, of course, when the British or the French tried to get rid of slavery in the Caribbean, they never imagined they'd be living alongside black people after emancipation. I mean, this is an enormous point about the United States that we have to try to remember. I mean, slavery is never just a problem of economics or just a problem of morality in the United States. It's also a social problem because it's pretty much the only place, well, the only place certainly where you have very large numbers of African-Americans living alongside very large numbers of white people, and in this case, also very large numbers of Native Americans, but also under this rubric of all men are created equal. Most of the slave plantations of the imperial world tended to have overwhelming black majorities. So many white reformers in Britain or France would conclude it's going to be really hard for white people to carry on running those societies easily after slavery. And they won't have the same integration challenge. But in the United States, that challenge is never just abolishing slavery. In effect, it's working out how to live alongside one another in harmony thereafter on the other side of slavery. And again, Manish, I mean, the tragic thing for me here is that that, in a sense, is a problem that uh, we're still trying to work out. Mm -hmm. So much about the book, so much about the text. Tell us a little bit more about the author. How did you get interested in history? How did you end up in Cambridge? And how did your professional career evolve? I got interested in history at school. I come from the UK, as you can hear, and now I'm working in the UK, although I've lived for many years in the United States. Um, I did my PhD in the US, so Cambridge is where I started out as an undergraduate and started my graduate work here. But then I came across to Princeton and I worked for six years there to get my PhD. And I think it's so important for those of us that work on the US outside of the United States to spend some serious time in North America trying to understand how the United States works from the inside. Um, it's also very important, I think, for us to get back as often as we can. So I've spent many years living in the United States and I never like to go too long without being back there in person because I don't know, it's just very important to keep your ear to the ground and, you know, talk to people and listen to people. And um, so that's a big part of who I am, I think, as a as an historian of the United States. Um, you know, I'm someone who's put the years in to try to understand the society as best I can. And I hope I'm not complacent about it either. I mean, you know, again, I, however long I carry on doing this, I hope that I can continue to get over and kind of immerse myself in the world there as often as I can, because um, I think that's really crucial for your practice as a historian. Um, in terms of this particular book, I've always been interested in inequality, uh, and I've also always been interested in what you might call moral evasion. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the stories that white people tell themselves to feel better uh, about things that they do in relation to people of color. And so I very easily found my way into this book when I thought that there might be, if you like, a segregation problem in American history before the one we all know about, which is the Jim Crow problem at the end of the 19th century. But I think it's one reason that this book has been tough reading for some people because as liberal whites, good and white people who style ourselves as enlightened, those of us who are white, we like to tell ourselves that the problems of racism and segregation are someone else's problems. You know, they're problems of uh, Southerners, you know, in Jim Crow era, or they're the problems of Donald Trump supporters, or they're never our problems, right? And I think in a way that what I want to do in this book is suggest that actually these issues of race and segregation have their liberal side, they have their liberal roots, as well as their sort of openly racist, reactionary, conservative roots. And we're never going to lick this problem or get close to understanding it as white people unless we understand its full extent. So that's where this book comes from, I guess, politically. And uh, I just hope that people, you know, will give it a chance and will read it carefully and think how much of this may resonate, you know, not just with what they know about history, but also with what they know about the worlds we live in today. So, We're talking to Dr. Nicholas Guyot, uh, the author of Bind Us Apart, 
fascinating title, Bind Us Apart. Yeah, it's um, uh, stolen, the title, as all good titles are, from uh, Nina Simone, who used those words specifically or explicitly in the song, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free, a song that she sang lots and lots during the 60s and the 70s. But um, one night she sang it in Montreux in Switzerland, uh, and she twisted the lyrics. So she <laughs> sang a different lyric to the one that she would usually sing or the one that she had sung uh, in lots of other contexts. And I found that really fascinating. Uh, the usual lyric was that she sang, I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart, remove all the bars that keep us apart. But actually, she said that she wished she could break all the things that bind us apart. And as far as I know, that's the only time that she used that version of it, which is very interesting. And it's a complete coincidence, but she'd just come back from living in Liberia for a couple of years. So that idea of breaking all the things that bind us apart, I found resonant because, I mean, the book in a way is about how liberal white reformers argued that they could become closer to, you know, realizing the equality of people of color by sending them someplace else. So rather than binding us together, they were bound apart. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a title borrowed from someone else, but I think that it's serendipitous and it does speak to the, the big themes of the project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you con contemplating writing other books and are you working on any other topics that may be interesting for our reader, listeners? Well, it's very early um, right now. I mean, you just finish a book and in some ways, the last thing you want to think about is the next one. But um, I am kind of keen uh, either to carry on in this area and think a bit about how uh, these issues of segregation work their way through in the North as well as the South later in the 19th century. Um, but I'll confess, I also have a project in mind thinking about how Americans come to think about empire uh, in the 19th century and particularly how Americans begin to understand all the empires of the world to actually going off and looking at other nations' empires. So looking at the British Empire or the Spanish or the Portuguese or even the Chinese or the Japanese empires. So I have an idea for a book that might be called Other People's Empires. So rather than thinking of empire as being something the U.S. invents, empire as being something the U.S. kind of learns about um, from Americans going off and studying other countries that have empires in the 19th century. So um, if I can find a way to make that interesting and compelling, that might be the next book. Thank you very much for your time and your comments, and uh, please do keep us in mind if you end up writing another book. Thanks very much for having me on, Manish. Thank you.